He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. I come to you today to present the gospel. I pray, God, give me boldness to speak to you the truth in all sincerity with gravity. Time is short. I don't have a lot of time. I've got notes here. I'm praying the Lord to give me the words to convey his truth to you, that the message from the gospel that w would save your souls, that would rescue you from darkness, from this false message that's being taught today, to where you can be ungodly, you can enjoy your sin, you can continue in your sin, you can have a worldly sorrow, you can say you're sorry and then go right on doing what you were doing and not have a heart sprinkled with the blood of Christ where the Holy Spirit shed abroad in your heart and makes you obedient out of a heart of love through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what my hope and prayer is. This message is not for any of those that have hardened their heart beyond being convinced of anything. Those of you that possibly have under a strong delusion, the scripture says that God will send a strong delusion to all them that love not the truth so as to be saved. It's not enough to believe and admit the truth and say, yeah, I believe that's true because it's written in the Bible. You have to love the truth within your heart so as it operates on your conduct or it has a resulting effect upon your conduct, even your thoughts. Your thoughts, it purifies the heart. But those that have received that delusion, and I wouldn't pretend to know who they were. There are signs, sure, there are signs that are evident. But to those that are under that delusion, it says that God would send them a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. So that all might be damned who love not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you don't love the truth. The truth is not in you. You walk in darkness. But I want to start in the second chapter of Peter. And, I, and right after his introduction, and I'm going to go fast. I'm going to go quickly. Forgive me. Follow and get your Bible out. Follow those of you that still have a, a broken heart. You still have some conviction. The Word of God still, is, still is, is precious, even though maybe not like it was at one time. Because you've been darkened by this message that you're hearing. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to rush. I'm going to go quick. Who knows, Lord willing, I may not get another chance to speak to you. But I pray that not what I say, but what this word says th that will not perish. The words that Jesus and his apostles and prophets spoke. That he said his word will judge every one of us on that day. I pray that word cuts to your heart. Beginning in the second chapter of Peter. Starting in verse 3, right after his introduction, he wastes no time. Listen to, listen to these words. According to his divine power, hath given us unto, all, unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and virtue. Whereby are given us exceeding great and precious promises. Is that what you want? Do you want the exceeding great and precious promise? That's what you cry out for mercy for that's what you that's what you want a new heart listen what he says about it that by these the exceeding great and precious promises you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust he doesn't just say in the world through sin he says through lust lust is conceived in the heart before the act is ever committed he said you can escape that corruption and beside this besides this that you've been given the divine nature on account of being given the divine nature to escape the exceeding great and precious promises. He says, give all diligence, earnest, intense effort. Give, pay close attention to, make it, make it, your, make it a, a, your duty. So don't neglect it. He says, make, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance. That's self-control, to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity or love for if these things be in you and abound they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ Jesus said 
that the Father is coming to look into the orchard, into, into his vineyard for fruit. And he does not find fruit. Or if he finds wicked fruit, he says both those trees are cut down and cast into the fire. They're hewn down, the scripture says. And remember John the Baptist's message. He says the axe is laid to the root. The, the Lord, he, his judgment is, is ready. It's, it's swift. And just because it doesn't happen in the time that you think, you think God's not noticing, he is noticing. And we'll see what his patience and long-suffering actually means. It doesn't mean that God approves of you. It doesn't mean that his judgment is not on the way and it's not prepared. And he says, he says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you be neither unfruitful or, or barren in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. But he that lacketh these things is blind. The, the scripture, the word in the Greek says they shut their eyes willfully. If you shut your eyes against the light, of the truth that directs your path and directs your step, then, then you're shutting your eyes, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And it says, and he cannot see afar off and hath forgotten he was purged from his old sins. And he says, to forget you're purged from your old sins, that, that's, that's the whole point of, of redemption, that your sins and transgressions could be blotted out. Not purged from the sins that you're going to continue in. Not purged from the sins that you intend, intend to commit. That's guile. It says, blessed is he and the man who the Lord doth not impute iniquity, in whose soul there is no guile. It doesn't say in whose soul there is no sin, but in whose soul there is no guile, where there's no reservation or allowance to commit sin or to entertain the thought of committing sin. Okay? So he says, wherefore the rather, brethren, again, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, what? Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, kindness, godliness, love. He says, if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom. Will an entrance be ministered to you ever abundantly if you don't do these things? Where's there even a hint, a suggestion that it's optional? Why would he make an appeal like this if it was just something you could say, well, I don't want to do that. That's okay. I'm already going to be in heaven. No, he says, if you do these things, you won't fall. And, and such an entrance will be ministered unto you abundantly. Why? Because the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Who are you serving? You serving Jesus, the Lord God Almighty? If you don't, he's not going to stop you. He'll let you do what you want, but, but, but to your own peril. I got a free will. No, you have the power of a will to choose good or evil. But God has denied the right to choose evil without suffering the consequence of damnation. He's worthy to be followed. Jesus has a right to tell you what to do. No man has to. If it's not within this scripture, he can't tell you to do something that's contrary to this word. But certainly, Jesus has a right. The Lord God Almighty has a right. He knows what will, what will give us a, a blessed hope or will, uh, will allow us to inherit eternal life. That's following his will, not yours. Second Peter 3, starting chapter 2. I, jumped, I skipped a chapter for a reason. I hope I can get to it. Starting in verse 2, he says that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken to you by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord Jesus and, and our Savior, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Notice the scoffers walk after their own lust. Lust is what is the exceeding great and precious promise in being partaker of divine natures that you can escape the corruption in the world that's through what? Through lust. But these scoffers walk after their own lust. And they're going to give you a message to lead you in the same exact path that they're walking. And he says, and saying, and what is the commandment of the apostles of the Lord Jesus? Just real quick. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples in all nations, making disciples, teaching them to observe, to follow, obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. 
What did Jesus command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. Revile not. Resist not an evil person. Be faithful unto death. Endure to the end. Take up your cross. Follow me. Hate your very life also. Lose your soul for my sake. That's what Jesus commanded. He said, and saying, they're going to say, the scoffers, walking after their own lust, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, since people in the past or since our, our generations in relation, whatever it, it means, have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were. Basically, that just nothing seems to have changed. And that's exactly what the generation of Noah did. They did the same thing, even with the preaching of Enoch and Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Noah was not an ark builder. He was a preacher of righteousness that built an ark through faith. He, he, he did it through faith. And they're saying, where's the promises of coming? Now, that they were a generation that was eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. That means they were marrying recklessly. They were, they were basically defiling the covenant of marriage, which that's, that's common today. That's the sign of a generation of Noah, that, that is, they're, they're friends with the world. They love this present world. And it says they're, they're acting like, where's the judgment? What, what do I got to be worried about? But the scripture says that the fool mocks sin. The scripture says that the wicked are insane, like Nebuchadnezzar, who was made to be like an animal for seven years. And he finally seem, seems to be from the scriptures that he repented. The seven years, like an animal, it says the wicked, the, the, those that commit sin, those that continue in sin are insane. But the, but the people, the religious people of the day in Jesus' time, they said he was insane. They said Paul was insane. For living the way they did and making the profession and not, tra not transgressing and going again into the yoke of bondage, into the world. And look at the revelation that, that the Lord gave to the prophet Ezekiel about how, what the disposition of people like this. Is this not a description of today? He says this in Ezekiel 33, starting at verse 30. Also thou son of man, the children of thy people are still talking concerning thee by the walls and in the doors of the house, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, hear what the word of the, of the Lord that cometh from the Lord, the word of the prophet that cometh from the Lord, excuse me. And they come unto thee as, people, as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. He says, For with their mouth... They show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. The Lord says, beware of covetousness, which is an idolatry. And anyone that has covet covetousness is an evil desire. The Lord says, the scripture says, such a man is an idolater. And idolatry, if anything, is condemned in the scriptures. It's idolatry. And it's also a sign you can't possibly love your neighbor as yourself if you're an idolater and a covetous man. How could that be? How can ungodliness and, and godliness coexist? How can they be the same when they're, when they're direct opposites? They're contrary to each other. He says, but their heart goeth after covetous, and, and lo, thou art, Ezekiel, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice. And can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do not do them. They do not do them. Here's the warning from James, the apostle. The apostle James, they, all the apostles except John, who it's, it's reasonable to conclude John was spared from martyrdom early because he was designated to take care of Jesus' mother, which is a, which is a powerful powerful thing just to think about how Jesus made that provision and, and John he was certainly was he he was tortured he was treated cruelly he was banished but but nonetheless the apostles all suffered martyrdom and and, and the, every one of them had the disposition of Stephen when, when he was martyred Lord lay not this sin to their charge That's, he's not saying Lord it, it, it's no big deal they're sent he's saying Lord you're the judge Lord I, I, I'm hoping they repent he di he didn't want them to suffer immediate vengeance and be struck from heaven because they were stoning him he was looking for that city he was he was an alien and strange in the world but he made the good confession 
Just that's the, that's the disposition of a true saint. They can make the good confession though they're being persecuted. They won't let go of Jesus and loving Jesus with all their heart. The Apostle James was courageously martyred for the faith in, in his faith in Christ. He was pushed off a balcony of about a two-story building and he survived. After seeing that he had life remaining in him, he was beat to death with clubs. He's he was faithful. And he said this, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doers of the word, which is in Jesus, what he spoke, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Back to Peter, chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that the Lord, uh, the day is, uh, day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Time is irrelevant with the Lord. Just because things seem to go on and on and drag on in your mind because years go by, that's nothing to God. It doesn't mean that his judgment isn't ready. And what, uh, but what does it mean? And Noah's generation was just like that. And their understanding was darkened. They would not hearken unto the voice of the prophet that could have rescued them. And then and God, in his long-suffering and kindness, made an appeal to rescue them. They hardened their heart. So that's no indicator that God is relaxing or not noticing the sin. I, I told you at the beginning, there's some, God will send a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. If you believe a lie, how can you possibly be saved? You can't. You're doomed. You're headed for eternal damnation. Now, I don't know who that is, but if the signs exist in you, cry out for repentance. God might grant you repentance. But he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness or the way that they measure God, slackness by time. Eternity, time is nothing in, 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 in measure, measured against eternity. But it's long-suffering. Here, here's why. He's long-suffering. The fact that you haven't been judged, the fact God hasn't wiped out anybody the moment they sin is is the kindness long suffering the good goodness of God toward because why he's not willing that any should perish he doesn't want you to perish but that all should come to repentance repentance is not saying I'm sorry as much tears as you cry you can't just say you're sorry with a worldly sorrow and continue in the sin the, the Proverbs in Proverbs 28, I believe it's 28, says, he that confesses, it says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. He that makes an excuse for his sin. He that continues or that covereth, that will not do what he's going to prescribe. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But he that confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. If you haven't forsaken your sin, you have not, you don't have mercy. You have the goodness and long suffering of God, not willing that you should perish. But that doesn't mean you're in his favor. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. He says if you confess and forsake. Now here's the appeal from God himself again through the prophet Ezekiel. He says, therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways. That's what Jesus says at the end of the, the scriptures. It, I, I will judge. I'm coming with my reward to judge every man according as his works deserve. If you sow unto the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow unto the flesh, you will reap corruption. But he that sows unto the spirit will reap everlasting life. He says, I, he says according to his ways, which which saith the Lord God, repent. Because he's going to judge every man according to his ways, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Iniquity is going to be your ruin. You can't continue that way. You can't continue in your sin. You, got, you must plead for the blood of Christ to sprinkle your heart and give you his divine nature to influence. Is he going to influence you beyond the ability of ever turning away? No. But he will give you the power. He will give you the influence so you hear his voice and you can follow him by faith that worketh by love. That's the saving faith. That's the faith that saves, that reaps the reward of eternal life, the inheritance. 
the hope before you. Okay? He says, cast away all your transgressions whereby you've transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves or repent. That's turning away, forsaking. Turn yourselves and live. God himself is saying, turn and live. He can't, he's not going to make you repent. He's not going to make you. He's saying repent and live. God does not have fear or hope. God, in other words, God does not hope for something to add to what he doesn't already have. He's, he's completely eternal in his nature in every attribute. He doesn't fear if someone rejects him. He's made the provision of what is going to happen to all those that will not obey him. He became the author of eternal life to all them that obey him. Don't let your false teachers, the pastors of your church, tell you you don't have to obey. And Jesus is still the author of your salvation. Jesus said, obey, follow me. What does follow mean? It can't be, well, Jesus, follow, Jesus didn't say follow, to himself, follow himself. He says, you follow me. I know that sounds ridiculous. That's how ridiculous the doctrine is. It's a doctrine from Satan himself. That says you can you can sin and you won't surely die. Come on, think don't don't be deceived. The Lord says many will be deceived, and and the, the false prophets arise in a climate where iniquity abounds because they're going to tell you a message that appeals to your flesh that says no you, you're all right that's okay God understands you can't help it you can't do any better than that you can't live for righteousness. You can't have all the fruits of the Spirit. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, if that's not you, just try to be meek. And if you can't be meek because it's just not your personality, that's okay. God understands. So even if you're impure in heart, you're still, you're going to see God. That's the false message. Listen to what Jesus said. Think about that. Think about that. Is what any man says going to nullify and negate the effectiveness or the, the power of the words that Jesus spoke can possibly be, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. It doesn't matter what the experience, it doesn't matter how successful something is in terms of numbers. The masses are going to hell. They're, they're on the road to destruction, which is broad, and many there be that go that way, Jesus said. Back to the apostle, 2 Peter 3. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Because this earth is reserved for fire, and that it will melt with fervent heat. What sort of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, seeing that you have your hope for that new heaven, the new earth, the city of God, Zion, the city of God, whose Jesus is the builder and architect. He says, what sort of persons he says ought you to be but he says be diligent be diligent again he uses the same word that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless a pure bride that has made herself ready she's washed herself she's clean she's pure she's not in the bed of adultery and then Jesus comes and drags her out and says come on we have to get married because I promised I would no matter what you did come on people you, you, would you expect that from your earthly, if you were engaged and, and, and your, your husband, or doesn't matter, vice versa, showed up to the wedding after having a date with an old boyfriend or girlfriend? You're like, wait, we're not married. Well, not, we're not getting married. You don't, you don't love me. What do you mean I don't love you? I'll get me Because you're not forsaking anything, anybody. Come on. Jesus, if anybody deserves a pure bride, it's Jesus. He's going to have that. And if you're not pure, if you haven't purified your heart by faith, then you're not his bride. I don't care. The scriptures doesn't care what your profession was. If you repeated a prayer and a pastor told you, just believe, trust me, you're saved. He's a liar. He just led you into deception. 
He just helped and seal your damnation. If you're saved, you have a new heart. The Holy Spirit's been shed abroad in your heart. The love of God. And he witnesses with your spirit that you are a child of God. Why? You're not walking in darkness anymore. You don't have to have someone say, well, don't, do you want to share your testimony um, about what Jesus did for you? No, you're saying, L listen to what Jesus did for me. He's cleansed my heart. He's blotted out my transgression. I don't know how I can serve him enough. That's what you won't have to have be, be pleaded with to have a testimony of, of Jesus. Okay? All right. He says that. But in what we've read so far in this third chapter, think of where's there a hint of evidence that could reduce the apostles' word to nothing more than a casual suggestion? Why would Peter, uh, how, but where would he say you can choose to comply or not comply based on your own personal discretion or your own decision? Is anything suggest that what he just said is optional to the saints that are persecuted? Where's there any shred of evidence? That would lead you to believe he's supporting a false doctrine where Jesus fulfilled every obligation for you. Why didn't he just say that? Why didn't he tell him, just give up trying to be obedient and do the will of God? You can't do it. Jesus is doing it or has done it for you. He didn't do it for you as an example for you to follow. He did it so that you wouldn't have to follow him. People... Come on, think. Just think about it for a minute. Time's flying. He didn't say that. He says, he says that, he says, how could you continue in, in sin and, 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 and still expect, based on what Peter said, that you're going to inherit eternal life? Like you're standing behind, which that's what they say today, you're standing behind some filter that Jesus is blocking God's ability to see you transgress. People, that is a conjecture. That is a made-up premise. It's made up, and they force the Scripture to justify it by picking a few here and there that seem to imply. But any interpretation is not going to negate a clear, emphatic statement somewhere else. Can we possibly interpret the Scriptures, no matter how it seems to, to, to uh, reveal itself, that the disobedient and sinful that are walking in darkness are still going to inherit eternal life? How is that following Jesus whom you claim you love? He, look what he says here. Let me, let me continue on. He says, and Paul, now let me just jump real quick to Paul, and, and, and I'm going to go fast. He says to the Ephesians, Blessed be the God of, and there's a purpose in this because Peter's going to refer to it later. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He's blessed us with spiritual blessings. He's chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Love is obeying his commandments and, and delighting to obey his commandments. That's, that's the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That's what Jesus said. Any other kind of love that is contrary to obedience to what Jesus said is perverted. It is not a love. It's a human love. And if you reduce God into an image like yourself, and you think he is like as to yourself in your own form of love that is not in accordance with the way love is defined in the scriptures, you are in great danger because you have just set yourself up an image that is other than the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible says, this is love that you keep my saying. He says, he that loveth me keepeth my sayings. He that loveth me not keepeth not my word. Now look what he says. To the Galatians, stand fast therefore in the liberty, chapter 5, verse 1, wherewith Christ has made us free. Stand fast. Stand fast in the liberty. You don't have to stand fast today. They, they say the liberty you have is do whatever you want and just believe you're definitely going to be in heaven as soon as you breathe your last or this, this, this false imminent return thing where you're going to be snatched away before you have to stand the, the trial of your faith. It, it's people. You're, be, you're set up for destruction. And it's an, easy, it's an easy message to believe. 
because it allows everybody to interpret this word however they want. It says it's of no private interpretation. Jesus and his apostles and the prophets, they've declared the will of God for every man. And the, and the apostle is going to say the same thing. He says, but don't use your liberty where Christ made you free. He says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage to your carnal nature. Don't, be entangled. don't go back into the world. He says, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness is the crown of life. The hope of righteousness by faith. The faith that worketh by love. The faith that produces the virtue or the fruits of the Spirit. He says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth nor uncircumcision of the flesh. Of course, that's a work of the hands that means nothing. But faith with which worketh by love. This has great advantage. That's what the word avail means, advantage. But it says physical observances, just, just doing the religious things, they avail nothing. Not if your heart's not purified. Not if you're not... Work, have a faith that works by love. If you have a dead faith, you have the faith of demons. But the demons have enough sense to tremble. Many of you don't even have enough. You're not even trembling. But the saints fear God. The saints fear God. They don't want to transgress and disobey and offend Him. More than they don't want to burn in hell for eternity. Even though that's dreadful for sure. For sure that goes without saying. Continue chapter 5. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only don't use your liberty as occasion for the flesh, but by love, by love, pure love, serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Grace, the divine nature, or the exceeding great and precious promise that's given to the saints, grace establishes and fulfills the holy commandments of the Lord, especially what Jesus taught. Can can this holy commandment alone, love thy neighbors thyself, can it be fulfilled and established by lying, by filthy communication, by coveting what belongs to another man, by committing adultery, by, t by abandoning your spouse, you you're loving your neighbor, you're you can't do any more to prove you hate, not just your neighbor, you hate the person you've vowed your o an oath to for life. You, you can't possibly be loving your neighbor because you don't have the grace that purifies the heart or you've rejected it. You've, you've had to be. It can't be both. He can't. It isn't a suggestion. He says we're, we're to fulfill. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, he's warning them, take heed, you be not consumed. This I say then, verse 16, walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. If you're not led of the spirit, you're under the law. The law condemns you. But he says, it, you're not under the law if you're led by the spirit because you're not violating God's commandment. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. Just let the scripture interpret itself. Just read the scriptures like a letter. Don't separate the words by chapter and verse. Just read the letter so that you have all of the appeal, just like you would if someone sent you a letter, uh, a mail, a four-page letter. You're not going to take page three and say, this is what he just told me or she. You're going to read the whole thing, and then you'll know what they're trying to communicate to you. And that's what he says. He says, now, now he says, look, look at this. He says, the works of the flesh... The flesh that lusteth against the spirit. The works of the flesh are evident, are manifest, they're crystal clear, and they're these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's all immorality completely, everything imaginable. Idolatry, which is covetousness. Remember, a covetous man is an idolater. I didn't give you that scripture, but it's there. It's, it's in quite a few places. Covetous, uh, idolatry, witchcraft. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. If you rebel against this word, that's a sin like the sin of witchcraft because what you're going to do is try to contrive another means of salvation for your soul. And you're, 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 you're coming against the clear word, which is the only way to come to Christ, to God, is by Christ. Okay? Hatred. Hatred. If, if you covet, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. You can't hate. Variance, emulation, 
wrath, strife, strife, seditions, seditions, dividing the body, heresies, kind of the same category, envyings, envying, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, just the party, party with the world, whatever, what a, this friendship with the world, and such like of the things which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now look how he's framed it. He said it emphatically. It, you can't make a more direct statement. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's the Apostle Paul warning people that he wants them to, per that he, he's hoping they persevere, that they continue in the faith and that they repent. And he's saying if you do these things, and he's not just talking about outward sins of the flesh, he's got those too, but the sins within the heart, envying, strife, wrath, all that, all that kind of thing, hatred, I mean, I mean, whatever you want to, uh, to imagine, he's covered the heart and the, uh, the deeds, the words and the deeds, is what I'm trying to say. The false prophet who's seducing you with his molded words and clever anecdotes on Sunday, so you kind of chuckle every time there might be, especially if there's any possible thing said from the scriptures where you're convicted, then it's all, he always lightens it up and and put some cushion there so that you just just to let you know you're you're still going to heaven. I didn't mean to make you feel bad, especially if it's something that points directly to some sin that you're involved in or someone you know is involved in. It's it's lightened up. So he's got you convinced that you can actually pursue. Now think about this: you can pursue or remain in any of the above sins. You can't help it. It's because there's been a lot of stress on your life bunch of psychological nonsense that will keep you in bondage. And he says, that, and, and, and then they squelch the slightest convictions that you might have. The, and they call the, that genuine conviction is unfounded guilt that should not have a place in the, in the heart of a believer. Because now you get to sin and not feel guilty about it. God forbid. But there is condemnation of those that walk after the flesh. There's condemnation. That's that the whole scriptures teach you that from the beginning to the end. He says, your pastor's telling you that you can remain or pursue these things and, and have this disposition. And he doesn't say that directly. I understand that. He'll he'll strongly cry out against it for for at least what seems to be in sincerity for at least a, a time. And even possibly to the point of tears, but he always ends with the message of peace, peace, when there really is no peace, by reaffirming that you, for you and giving you comfort that you're going to go to heaven regardless of whether or not you heed the warnings or not. No change has to be affected. You can live how you want. All he's doing is assisting you and sealing your own damnation. That's frightful. That's dreadful. You should, you should run from that teaching. Your understanding's been greatly darkened already because you've chose to, to love your sin rather than God. Your conscience is seared as with a hot iron. Look what the apostle says. He states this as an absolute in the form of, like, of a subpoena. A subpoena is irrevocable. It can't, it can't be, there's, there's no other interpretation or there's no exit clause, you might say, out of a subpoena. When you're, it's issued, you have to appear other than dying. You have to appear. And that's what he says in this statement. They that do such things shall not, absolutely no, never, no, cannot, no way, shall not inherit the kingdom. Okay, look at, but look, contrast, contrast. Here, here's the blessedness. Here's the, the gift of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. What can you add to that? Walk in the Spirit. Who testifies of what? Of Jesus, the truth. 
which is the Lord Jesus in his teaching, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh and thus exclude yourself from the inheritance. The Philippians, Paul wrote this, and this I pray that your love may abound more and more. I'm going to go really fast. That you may approve things that are excellent and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. There it is. He wants them to be sincere without offense until the day of Christ when he calls forth the just and the unjust. To those that have done good, there'll be a resurrection of righteousness. To those who have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Now, you try to create a third class of people that have professed the name of Christ but are still doing evil and are going to be resurrected under righteousness, you are in danger. And, and that's why I'm telling you, escape from that message. Go to the Word. Listen to what Jesus said. Because those, the, the teachers that are teaching you that are false prophets, they're part of the false prophet or the many antichrists. And there it says their condemnation will be, their punishment will be greater. That's why it says, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. You better make sure you're telling people what the narrow way is and to abide faithful and to hold fast to that, the, the, the word of their profession, their first love, Jesus, hold fast. Okay? Okay, He's, he goes on with Philippians. And, and he says, But you may approve, sincere, without offense, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. The fruits of righteousness are unto the glory and praise of God, that, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Not works of the flesh, but works of the Spirit. But if you don't consent, if you will, will, will re reject with your will to follow in faith with your heart and obey the fruits of the Spirit and cry out for the fruits of the Spirit in your life, the Lord's not going to force you with like, compunction. He's not going to make you. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have hope or fear for, for anything. You have hope or fear. That's, that's what the message is. God, God is not going to lose if you reject him. You lose. And you've got to strive, and you've got to strive to enter in like he's laid out in his word. Look what he says in Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. This is verse 5, chapter 2, 6, 7, and 8. And took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He's required us to be obedient unto death and to receive the reward of inheritance. He's required you. If, you're, if you haven't repented, pray, ask God, beg for repentance. That he, You can't just repent at the drop of a hat. That's what a lot of you think. That's why you've repented with worldly sorrow. When things happen and you get in trouble and there's, there's, there's bad things happen as a result of it, you say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you cry, but then you, your heart's not changed. You can't just call for it. It's a no man coming unto the Father but the, but, except the Spirit draws him. So you can't just call on repentance. God gives so many opportunities to repent. Clearly in his justice and righteousness and mercy, his judgment is righteous. So he's going to give every man a chance to repent to where he'll be without excuse at the day of judgment. But you can't just presume on God and say, Lord, I'm going to go and do this sin. And then, Lord, I will catch up with you when I'm done fulfilling my own sinful pleasure. And then I'll get right with you. No, because you might not even know what repentance is like and think you've repented, but you remain in the sin. You haven't forsaken. Therefore, you haven't received mercy. That's what the Word says. This, I mean, this, that's what the Word says. Jesus says the way is narrow. Continuing on, he, was a, he requires us to be obedient. He's given us His grace to lead the way by influencing the heart, that voice of the shepherd, that His sheep hear and follow in another's voice. They will not. Will you forsake this world and repent while there's still time? Will you run for the prize of the high calling, which is in Jesus Christ, who's the builder and architect of the heavenly city? Is it worth it? Jesus said your soul is worth more than the entire world. A lot of you are selling your soul for nothing. Even if you got the whole world, you'd have sold your soul for nothing. 
That, that, and it's going to soon pass away with, with the no, great noise and, and, and indescribable heat. Are you going to take the fatal step like a Judas and sell Jesus out for nothing, for the sins that are holding you in bondage and rushing you towards eternal damnation? Is, that, is it worth it? What's this world have that you want next to the one that created and says he's going to destroy it? He's willing to give you an inheritance in his kingdom. You know that the, your sin hasn't given you any freedom. The truth is that your sin that you've submitted yourself to to obey is your master. It, is, it rules your life. You're in, you're in bondage by, by, by Satan. You're, you've been taken captive to do his will. You're not doing the will of God, so you've got to be doing the will of your master. You can't have a divided heart. You can't serve two masters. Jesus said either you will love the one and hate the other. So, yeah, I know you're not saying I, with your mouth, I hate. But Jesus said, if indeed you deny him, you're a God hater. That's a frightening, dreadful thought. You have submitted yourself as a servant to obey your carnal nature. You prefer the pleasure of sin rather than loving Jesus with a pure heart. Jesus isn't worth it to you. He's not good enough. And what he's offered is not good enough for you to reject and to turn away from your sin. Will you continue to deceive yourself that you're one of Christ's sheep, who's the great shepherd of souls, while you obey the voice of his enemy? Wake up and arise from the dead. Christ will give you life. Don't deceive yourself. Don't stay in that darkness. Don't even listen to that such a message. Paul goes on. With the Colossians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, I'm sorry, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You don't shine if you're not blameless and harmless sons of God. If you're like the world and you love it, how are you shining as a light? You're not. You're part of the world. You're deceived. You're in darkness. Colossians that one chapter one verse ten that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. They were being persecuted, and but they were they were being patient, joyful, and they were remaining fruitful unto every good work. They were partaking of the suffering of Christ. But they were standing steadfast, firm in the faith, giving thanks unto God the Father, which hath made us meet or called and qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance, the crown of life of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, delivered us from the power of darkness. You don't have to submit. to the, you, can, you can be more than a conqueror through him that loved us and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated in your minds by wicked works, he hath now reconciled in the body. How can you, how can you be reconciled if you continue in wicked works? That, he says that you were alienated. That means you're not a part of. You're actually contrary to. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, that's what a lot of times they'll read that who, who, who through his death to present you holy and unblameable, unreprovable in his sight and see it's just sealed, guaranteed, no matter what you know. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, what faith? The faith that worketh by love. How do I do that? Through the grace of God, the love of the Holy Spirit that's been shed abroad on your heart by following the voice of your shepherd. If he truly is your shepherd. And following that voice and not following the voice of another. And he says, if you continue the faith, not moved away. Not, don't be permitted to be deceived by a false teacher that's going to let you be moved away from that hope. From the hope of the gospel which you've heard. And which was preached to every creature under heaven. Verse 26. Even this mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory. What is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles? Which is, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then he says this. 
Not Christ being confessed with your mouth. I'm just making this a point here. I just w- wanted to make this point. Just It's not just a confession with your mouth or you giving credit to him for obeying for you, but it's Christ in you effectively working in you to the praise of his glory, which is the fruits of the Spirit. That's what glorify the Lord. That You stand out as lights among a crooked and perverse and crooked generation. You're not serving his enemy, which is sin and disobedience. And then Paul says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. True wisdom, true teaching from someone that's a true minister, an elder in the church, the body of Christ, will teach and warn every man to strive with an obedient faith till the end of his life and be on guard against any teaching to the contrary. Such is, is rooted in the nature of Satan himself. They're a wolf and they're a deceiver. Paul says, I labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Okay, let me just rush ahead here. I'm going to have to skip by some some of the scriptures. It's all over. Look what Paul says to Timothy. Colossians in chapter 3, excuse me, he says, Mortify therefore your members, it says, which are fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, covetousness, which is idolatry. For such things the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. The deeds of the flesh are associated with disobedience, which is unbelief and even hatred towards God by your deeds. So he says to mortify those things. To Timothy, he says the end of the commandment, Jesus' royal commands, the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. That word unfeigned means faith without hypocrisy. It's a true faith, obeying from the heart, a faith that worketh by love. It's a, it's a saving faith, a faith that perseveres, that gives you strength, that is your strength to endure to the end faithful. And he says, that's the end of the commandment. And then he later in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verse 3, he says, after telling him what the purpose of the commandment, telling him what to teach to husbands, wives, children, and, and who is elders, who should be deacons, on and on, their character is, in, in life is literally beyond a charge of sin in their life. They're, they're holy. In, they're, he even told Timothy to be pure towards the maidens, toward the virgins and stuff, and treat them like sisters. And he says this, if any man teach otherwise, other than what Paul taught him, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the wholesome words. Not my words. But Jesus' words are the wholesome words. If any one does not consent or is not in agreement with Jesus' words and the doctrine which is according to godliness, not a profession, but godliness that has power with it. The power of godliness is to overcome the world, to sin, the flesh, and the devil, that you might escape the corruptions in the world through lust, through grace. Through grace, but grace doesn't isn't going to force you, because how are you going to how are you going to exercise faith if you are rebelling against the command? Jesus didn't make anyone follow him, but those that chose to follow, they followed, and when they became truly converted, they were uncommonly strong in the faith. He says, and does not consent to the doctrine short according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing. But he's doting about questions and strifes of words. That means things that don't save while disregarding the eternal weighty things that have, uh, that have an impact on your eternal soul. Wherefore cometh envy, strife, railings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness or that their doctrine is for this present world. In other words, that their, their preaching or their teaching is for worldly advantage. Things that are going to be pa- pass away. Peter says this to finish up, and I I haven't gone fast enough. Forgive me. Let me just close out here with Peter in the second chapter, and then try to finish out with what I intended for you from the Word. And he says, "And account the long suffering of the Lord as salvation. The long suffering of the Lord is not that he's slack. It means salvation. There's a chance that you can still repent." And he says, "Even as our brother beloved." Brother Paul, also according to the wisdom hath written you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, 
These things, warning every man, teaching people to be blameless, holy, to persevere in the faith, to continue steadfast, enduring in the faith that worketh by love, to obey Jesus, to hear his voice, to re refuse to hear another voice. And he says, in which some things are hard to understand in Paul's epistles. That, that doesn't mean they can't be understood. They're hard to understand by a certain type of person, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or they twist, misapply, as they do also the other scriptures and to their own destruction. He says, you can twist the scriptures to their own destruction, and it's those that are unstable or unlearned, that's what they do. And he says, ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things that I've told you about how people twist what Paul writes, what I write, he says, see that you don't be led away or beware, he says, lest you're led away with the error of the wicked, the error of the lawless. They're lawless. They want the, they want the scriptures to approve of them continuing in their sin. And they're going to they're twisting their scriptures to their own destruction. That which should give them life is the stumbling stone. It's not precious. They're not building on that cornerstone. They're stumbling. And he says, so he says, beware if you're led away of the air of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. What steadfastness? Steadfastness of the faith of continuing to work out with fear and trembling your salvation, continuing in the faith that worketh by love, that obeys the voice of God and produces the fruits of righteousness under the praise of His glory. Okay? And then I, I had some other notes here, but listen. Now listen to 2 Peter chapter 2. And let me go quickly and end with the words of the Lord. I, I'm going to completely just quote the scripture here. And I don't mean to bore you, but this is powerful. You can't say it any better than the apostles and what Christ said. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they with feigned hypocritical words. They shall make merchandise of you whose judgment now the long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God did not spare the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not that old world but saved Noah and eight persons, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. That's your example if you live ungodly. Noah's generation that were drowned in Sodom and Gomorrah, that were overthrown with fire, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and they despise government. Presumptuous are they. That means you can sin and you're not even, even thoughtful. You're completely... You have no place in your mind about any consequences. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. That means that they, they speak evil of authority because they will be ruled by no authority but their own, their own wicked heart. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not a railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts, that he even reduces them to senseless animals. <laughs> There's animals that are, have more sense than people in, the, in their conduct. But these are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that will not cease from sin." Beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practice, their cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone the way 
astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with the man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of a, whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it was better if they had not known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned in his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. When you go back into sin, when you go into transgression after knowing the way of righteousness, it's like you're eating the vomit again. Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and I'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, look, look to it, take heed, let it get into your heart, Matthew 5 through 7. He says, whoever heareth these words of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a white, and do with them, I will liken to a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. That's persecution, trial, temptation. They, they stood. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house on sand. And when... All those same things come, the rains, the floods, the winds, and beat upon that house. It fell, and great was its fall. If you are not doing what Jesus said, yet still hoping to inherit eternal life, Jesus said, you're like a fool. You're building your house on the sand, and it will fall. God grant you repentance. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie.